Good. If you have your Bibles, turn to Second Peter. We're in chapter two, and I'm going to read verses one through nine. If you remember, we um, just kind of barely got into verses one through three last week. We're going to continue. Uh, down to verse 9 this morning. I'll read the text, we'll pray, and then get started. Second Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we look forward to to open the words of life. And today we ask, Lord, that you would teach your people, open our hearts and minds to receive now your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So by way of review, just very quickly, and as you heard me read through that text, I'm going to ask, um, this is a little bit different. I'm going to ask a question. And it's not rhetorical. I want you to answer back, right? So we looked last time that um, fault, what do false teachers, false prophets do? A few of the things they either add to God's word or they take away, they subtract. Or they multiply followers or multiply errors. We looked at how error begets error begets error and it tends to multiply. We see that they divide. They don't rightly divide God's word or they don't make God's word straight. They tend to twist it or to move it out of its joint, to move it out of its context and make it uh, uh, say whatever they want it to say. So keep those things in mind. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. We ask about who are these false prophets? Just in review. There are those who are deceivers. They are charlatans. They are con men. They are playing the church and they know it. They're in it for the money. The the scripture says one of the two uh, great motivators of false teachers, one of the fruits that we should inspect, their sensuality, idolatry, and uh, or sensuality, um, lust, and greed, right? The two things, sensuality and greed. We see that sometimes the deceivers are deceived themselves. They are deceiving others because they themselves are deceived. So there's two categories. Sometimes they're big and loud and they have these huge followings, right? Just thousands or even millions of people follow them. Sometimes they're small and sneaky. Remember, they secretly come in. They are hidden reefs below the the, the waters that are unseen. They um, are creeps. Remember Jude? They creep into the church. 
So that's big and loud and small and sneaking. Sometimes they're without the church. They're outside of the New Testament church. But also there are those false teachers that are within the church, members of the church, okay? So keeping all of those things in mind, I'm going to ask, and you just give a few quick answers. Uh, these uh, false teachers that Peter is warning about in Second Peter, um, are they adding anything to God's word? Yes, very good answer. What are, what's the scripture say? Y'all aren't used to answering questions, I know. Yes, they are introducing destructive heresies, right? They are adding to God's word. Are they taking anything away from God's word? Are they subtracting anything? What? Very good answer. Man, the man on the front row has all the right answers. Yes. I'm going to have to think of a question that is no. <laughs> what are they doing? What's the scripture say? They deny Christ. Now, we have to go down a quick rabbit trail here, and I told you that this, this, this phrase here caused my brain problems, right? I didn't like it. I don't like it. Peter didn't ask me, right? But it's, it caused problems in my thinking. And it says this, verse 1, false prophets arose among them, they'll arise among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. And then this, even denying the master who bought them. Now, what part of that phrase is so difficult? The, the, the thought that they are bought. What does that mean? It almost sounds like Peter is saying that these false teachers have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ and having been bought by his blood, they'll soon suffer eternal destruction because it says they're bought and that their destruction is not idle, it's not asleep. How do we put those things together? We're, that, that's a, that caused my brain problems, right? Is this the fact, does this mean that Jesus does shed his blood for everyone and only some will um, um, receive the benefit of it? Is that what it means? No, you know, that, hey, that was the no answer right there, man. You missed it. Right? So, no. Does this mean that uh, Jesus' blood was wasted on these false teachers? Another way of asking the same question. Does this mean that these false teachers were ripped out of Jesus and the Father's hands by their own denials? We understand from the whole of God's Word. Remember, we talked about that triangle. False teachers will do this. They will focus in on a verse like this that's difficult. And then they'll say, that's my verse. And they'll have one verse and then they'll want to build the rest of everything in their knowledge of Scripture on that one point. And they'll force everything to fit in. And it's like making a triangle stand on its tip, right? But what do we need to do to make sure that we don't fall to false teaching is we build that, that firm foundation of a triangle that sits firmly on its base and the beginning of that ba base begins in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and the end of that base goes to Revelation chapter 21. We understand and learn the whole of God's word, right? The whole counsel and we don't just take one verse and say, oh, and build everything on it. And so knowing the whole of Scripture, we know that this, can, uh, this bought here cannot mean an eternal redemption, right? So I sent home some homework uh, uh, from Ligonier. Hopefully it was helpful. The point of that article was that, there's, that we see these times in Scriptures where there's a sense of the word, very similar to um, the unbelieving spouse that is sanctified, right? That's another time that that's just a difficult thing to put your head around. That there is a manner of sanctification. There is a manner of being bought, a sense of it, but it's not an eternal bought and it's not an eternal sanctified. 
So we have to understand that by looking at the whole of Scripture. And that was the point of that um, Ligonier thing. I had two more things I wanted to say um, about this difficult statement that the scripture consistently warns us of the very, very close proximity of those who will spend eternity in hell, right? And just as a very quick uh, rundown, the wheat and the tares are planted so tightly, so close, that in that parable, Jesus says you can't rip out the tares, right? Right? Because they are so tight, their root systems are so tightly intertwined with my precious wheat. That's close. That's right in there, right? So that's a, and then we see the many are called and few are chosen. The guy gets into the banquet and he is cast out, right? We see the, the, the um, devastating words, Lord, Lord, did we not? And when they list off their resume, it's more impressive than mine, right? Lord, Lord, did not we prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we perform many miracles? I haven't produced one. I haven't made, been a part of one, <laughs> Right? He's got a very, that's very, very uh, uncomfortable. And then the the very example of Judas Iscariot. That uh, the very night in which our Lord was betrayed, and he says that he's going to be betrayed, that all 12 of them are like, who is it? You would think by that point, after all those uh, three years of being together, they were like, I knew it all the time. It was Judas, right? But no, they did not. It was, they were uh, um, in the dark as well. Now, I think sometimes, as we read John, that John had some suspicions, maybe of all the 12. Because every time he mentions Judas, he could tell it, yeah, I mean, he was stealing. I don't like that guy. <laughs> John has some little phrases in there. But look at what second, let's go back to the text in Second Peter. Look at what it says about false prophets, false teachers. False prophets were among the people in Israel, just as there will also be false teachers, what? Among us, among you, in your midst. Jude is a wonderful parallel passage to this 2 Peter chapter 2. So as we continue through 2 Peter chapter 2, you would do well to also study Jude alongside of it. And that's where the scripture says, certain persons have crept in unnoticed. They're creeps. They creep in. And no one knows it. They can't see it. That Later on in that scripture, it says, these men are hidden reefs in your love feast. They are taking the Lord's Supper with you, but they are hidden reefs. Reef is destruction, right? To your ship. And then when it's hidden, it's a terrifying thing. I never saw it coming. It's right under the surface. And I would warn us that there is a major false religion today that is doing its best to submerge itself in Christianity, and that is the Mormon religion. They have taken a turn at some point, and uh, where it was above the waterline, now they're doing their best to submerge it, just under the waterline, with things like this. Oh, it's just like another denomination. You got Baptist, you got Methodist, you got Presbyterians, you got Mormons. We're, that's a hidden reef, brothers. It's a hidden reef. It's false teaching. And they're doing their best to bring it just under the waterline. So watch out for it. Peter also, I would just say this quickly. I put a whole page there, but I'm going to try to say it quickly. Peter is also using um, uh, slavery terminology. And I say here that we uh, as modern Americans have an allergy to slavery terminology, right? It's part of our culture. But if we uh, continue to try to step away from it, well, we we will not understand the New Testament. 
The New Testament is full of slavery terminology. Bought, redeemed, all of that is slavery terminology. Master, Lord, all slavery terminology. In this very book, Peter begins it this way, and it's also in the New American Standard an evidence of how over the years even our interpreters have tried to step back from slavery terminology. Because we read it this way, uh, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant, right? A bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Bond servant is actually a softening of that term. It's a stepping away from what that term means. That Greek word is doulos, and guess what it is? The most common word for slave. So when in the New Testament church that received this letter heard Peter say, they didn't hear bond servant. They heard Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. A immediate and quick declaration that Jesus is my master. I am first his slave and then his apostle. We need to, and John MacArthur has a wonderful series on this where he hammers it, right? Sermon after sermon after sermon that we understand what we are. We are slaves, right? And what do slaves do? Slaves do the will of their master. And we have to be very careful. We can still um, object and be horrified of the horrors of slavery as it played out in in America while at the same time saying the New Testament is full of slave imagery and I myself am a slave of Christ. We have to be very careful with that. But if you read it in that light, um, you see that the, the 2 Peter 2, 1 again, that they even deny the master who bought them. It's just slave terminology. What is a slave but someone who is purchased by a master, right? And when these false teachers are claiming to be slaves like Peter and Paul, they deny the master who bought them. They though show themselves to be false prophets, false teachers, false slaves. And Jesus used this Uh, argument all the time. Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Or what? Master, Master. And you do not do what I say. 1 John says this, the one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. See, I think you can also see that or in my mind, That when Peter says that they are even denying the master who bought them, that uh, the the false, that the uh, describes the claims of the false teachers, not the claims of God, right? The false teachers claim to be slaves of Christ. But his point is, but they deny him, right? They are claiming to be slaves but they don't do what he says. So it's not as much that he's describing the claims of God. We know eternal redemption is not theirs because Peter clearly says that their destruction is not asleep. But what they are doing is claiming to be slaves of Christ. And remember that many will say, Lord, Lord, right? Um... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, this is Matthew 7, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? What will his answer be? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you Depart from me, you who practice unrighteousness. 
So we see that they're adding to God's word. We see that they're subtracting, taking away. They're even denying Christ. Are they multiplying in this text? Are they add? They they seeking to multiply followers? They seeking to multiply error? Always, right? Error begets error. They are introducing destructive heresies. And in verse 2, it says, Many will follow their sensuality. You know, when you lead people into sensuality, it's easy to get a following, right? Because that's very attractive, right? It's easy. Are they rightly dividing God's word? No, so they exploit you for, uh, with false words. Now, who are these prophets? Just as we review from last week, do you think they're deceivers or are they first deceived? Huh? Could be both. Sometimes we can't tell, right? It, sometimes we're fooled. They could be a deceiver. They could be deceived themselves but to me, almost looks like he's talking about their sensuality and their greed, which almost makes me think that they are deceivers, right? They're in it for the money. Are this, these uh, false teachers in this passage big and loud, or are they small and sneaky? I think they're small and sneaky. Why? Because they secretly introduce heresies, right? And then lastly, are they outside the church or are they inside? They're inside the church. They're among us, Peter says. So what else we do? This is in review. Preach the word in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Preach the word. Remember the triangle? The base is from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21. The only way we'll do that is if we preach the word verse by verse, book by book. We talked about that last week. If we do anything else but but that on a regular basis, we will miss the boat, right? Why? Because we'll end up teaching the things we like to teach and uh, and, and, um, staying away from the things we don't like, right? And we will not learn the whole of God's Word. We must teach the Bible, preach the word, verse by verse, book by book, in season, out of season. Test the spirits. Remember, beloved, do not believe every spirit. If you keep an open mind, people will throw trash in it. Test everything and make and take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. The third thing, inspect the fruit. You will know them by their fruits. We see here in 2 Peter, the fruits of most false teachers. Many will fall what? Follow their sensuality. And because of them, the truth of God will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. When we test the fruits Do we see sensuality and appeal to our sin nature? Do we see a greed and just a love of money? Lastly, remember the judgment, and that's what the rest of our text is about. Remember the judgment. God's judgment will be severe. Verse 1, they bring swift destruction upon themselves. Verse 3, their judgment from long ago is not idle. It's in play. It's, it's working itself out. It's coming their direction. It is closing in. Their destruction is not asleep. And that is so often the way it seems to us. Now, I've mentioned this in passing, but I wrote it out today that in the latter part of his life, um, I believe that Johnny Cash returned to Christ. And that just tickles me pink, right? I should be glad that everybody does, but I really love Johnny, right? Johnny Cash. And he wrote a, a song late in his life, and it's this, God is going to cut you down. 
And he goes like this, go tell that long tongue liar, go and tell that midnight rider, tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter, tell them that God is going to cut them down. Well, and then he tells his testimony in that song, and this is a great testimony. Well, my goodness gracious, let me tell you the news. My head's been wet with the midnight dew. I've been down on bended knee talking to the man from Galilee. He spoke to me in a voice so sweet. I thought I heard the shuffle of angels' feet. He called my name and my heart stood still when he said, John, go do my will. That's a pretty good testimony, right? And then he goes back to the chorus, tell that long tongue liar, go and tell that midnight rider, tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter, tell them that God is going to cut them down. He says, you can run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. You can run on, you can tell it's a song, for a long time. Sooner or later, God is going to cut you down. Dear friends, I think this, is, this song is a huge piece of the gospel that is missing today, right? What is the gospel today? Oh, God loves you, he loves you. And what's, what's in that? It's almost, hey, don't worry about it. God loves you. We're good. You and God, you're good. No, they will not understand the gospel until they know that first God is going to cut them down, right? My dad's been very involved in the... Uh, Christian motorcyclist and all of that. He knows a lot of people. And he was telling me one day about how the Kozaks have a chaplain. Now I said, wait, 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 wait. Say that again? Yeah, the Kozaks, this drug running gang, has a chaplain. I was like, how does that man stay alive? The only way he stays alive is that he only gives part of the gospel. Hey, it's okay. God loves you. I'm just here to tell you God loves you. Where's the part of the gospel that says, no, God hates sin and he will cut you down. It's a very, it's a huge missing part of the way that we are sharing the gospel. What does Peter say about these false teachers? The point is this, verse 9, the focal verse this morning. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly uh, from temptation. Point one. Point two, and he knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. What's the point? God knows what he's doing, right? God knows how to rescue the godly and God knows how to punish the ungodly. Just keep that in your mind. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. We're gonna look at them in reverse order. God knows how to judge the unrighteous. And uh, we see here that the scripture says that his judgment is not idle, it is not asleep. and uh, Peter gives really four examples in his book, but in our text this morning, he gives three examples, and then one of them is from chapter 3, and we see uh, about fire and flood. We see an ancient fire, verse 4, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment. So we're going to get a little bit down a rabbit trail. But I want us to remember the main point. And the main point is this. If God did not and will not spare angels when they sin, he will not spare false teachers either. Right? That's the point. But th there's so much curiosity in this text. I'm going to try to move very quickly and open a can of worms 
and then pass that can of worms to Brother Dub. That's what I like to do. And Brother Jason. Questions? See Jason or Dub? Right? So a whole series of questions on this. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right. So let's see what it says. God did not spare. He did not spare in the past angels when they sin, but cast them into hell. First question is, are all um, angels or fallen angels or otherwise known as demons, are all of them in hell today? No. All right. But some of them are. So which ones are and which ones aren't? And how did that come about? So the questions that I was thinking, who are these angels that are now in the abyss? What did they do? Why were they thrown in the pit then when others were not? Right? And then when were they thrown into the pit? So we go down this little series of clues and... Um, just a few things that we see in Scripture, and each one of those are unique and sometimes difficult passages. And strung together, um, we follow the clues. It's still something that's hard to understand. And it's not Jude 1. There's only one chapter. But Jude verses 6 and 7, we see that the angels, which did not uh, kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. What did they do? Well, they didn't keep their first estate, but left their own habitation. That basically means they got out of their lane, right? And the scripture says, He hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. What does this mean that they got out of their lane? What they, that they did not keep their first estate. They did not keep their own habitation. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of what the angels did. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, Sodom and Gomorrah, in the same way as these, the fallen angels, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh. Have I cleared it up? I hope so. No, I have not. They are, they are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal life or fire. So why were these angels that are now in the abyss thrown there? The scripture is clear as an example, right? As a reminder. And you know what I got to think in? Not just an example to us but maybe also an example to the demons that are even here today. You know they live in fear? The demons do, right? And maybe as much as for an example for us, that if even if the angels sin, they were thrown, we should fear sin, right? Sin will send you to hell like we were talking about. That's the first part of the gospel. Maybe these angels are also an example to the demons which God has allowed to continue even today. Don't get out of your lane. Remember these guys? And where are they today? Remember that uh, Luke passage? And I think I'd already passed it over it. When they were talking, Jesus met the one that was called Legion. What did Legion, this legion of demons, these are not the ones in hell. These are the ones on earth. What did they say? I beg you, do not torment me, right? And they were imploring him not to command them to go away to the abyss. And Matthew 8 says this, have you come here to torment, more torment us, what? Before the time. They know that they too will join those fallen angels in the pit, but they don't want to go there yet. So maybe these example is for us and the demons. Don't get out of your lane again as these did. But who are these angels that got out of their lane just as Sodom and Gomorrah, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah got out of their lane? By the way, very pertinent for our world today, what is our lane? If you are male, this is your lane. If you are female, this is your lane, right? That's how they got out of their lane. That's how they, they um, went after strange flesh, how they did not keep their first estate. And it's so pertinent for today. 
Let's keep trying to sort through this. When these angels were, when were they sent to the abyss? First Peter chapter three. <sighs> Another one of those texts. Jesus died. He went, and the scripture says this, he was made alive in the spirit, put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, and he went and made proclamation to the spirits that are now in prison. These are the angels that are already in the pit. Okay? Who once, when did they disobey? They once were disobedient, and when the patience of God kept waiting, when? In the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. So we see that these fallen angels were possibly, uh, probably thrown into this pit during the days of Noah. Well, what did they do? Well, we got yet another of those mystery passages as we're stringing them all along together. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, meaning angels, fallen angels, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. How does that work? I don't know. I don't know. It was washed away in the flood, right? But the scripture says it. They took daughters of men and they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whoever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Every one of those texts are difficult, right? And I would never have gone here if a trusted teacher of ours didn't lay it out that exact way. John MacArthur. So I, just looking at these texts, every one of them seemed to be talking about the same pit and the same fallen angels. So just bringing all that to you, it makes my mind hurt. But the point is this, and I'll go back to it and again say, if you have any questions, talk to Brother Jason. <sighs> back to the point, though. What's the point? The point is very clear. God knows how to punish evil. Period. He knows what he's doing, right? You can trust him with this. The evil in the world around us just seems to be multiplying. It's okay. God knows how to deal with it. He's dealt with it before and he will deal with it again. So stay calm, right? What's the two points? God knows how to punish evil and he knows how to rescue his people. That's what you need to remember, right? And that's what Peter is saying. So he sees that the, the, he punished these angels he punished the ancient world by flood. He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. He brought a historic fire, a fire in the past. He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by what? By reducing them to ashes. And again, having made them an example to us. America needs to listen to this example, right? Because just as the land of Sodom and Goral, people were getting out of their lanes, we, by the masses it seems, are getting out of our lanes. I used to think that that was the bottom of the last swoosh of the toilet before it all went down, right? But really, if you study Romans 1, there's one last round about the toilet before it all goes down. One past homo rampant homo homosexuality. And what is that? That not only do they do these things, but they demand that everyone else Give them tatas for it, right? That's not how it says it in Romans. That's the Greek. 
That they, they demand that everyone else approve them. That they, 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 they um, what's the word I'm looking for? Be best probably just to read it out of Scripture. Romans chapter 1. That last little flush of the toilet. And although they know the ordinance of God to stay in your lane, He created you male and female, period. And although they, we know this, that every cell in our body is either male or female, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but here it is, they give hearty approval to those who practice them. That's the last flush. And are we there or what? It's not enough that the, the closet is open. But now they demand that everyone come in and look in the closet and applaud them for what they're doing in the closet. That's the last flush. And dear friends, we need to hear their example. He reduced Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. God knows how to take care of evil and he will do it. And we see a very important text that we'll come back to a future fire. And that is this. Uh, we'll see it in chapter 3. But by God's word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. It is not idle, it is not asleep, but He is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But that's the good news of repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with what? Intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Dear brothers and sisters, God knows how to punish the wicked. He also knows how to rescue the godly, and I just have to zoom through these. Verse 5, he preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. We know in Genesis 6 that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, that he was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. How do we also uh, make it today in this wicked generation? Same thing. We seek the favor of God as grace. It was by grace alone that we will be saved from the fire to come. And we walk with our God. That's how we make it. Just like Noah made it. And we preach righteousness. He rescued Lot. Now how many of you, before you say Second Peter, never put the words righteous and Lot together? I didn't. But inspired by the Holy Spirit, who is a better judge of righteousness than me. The Holy Spirit through Peter said that he rescued righteous Lot. Why did he rescue that man? That man had found favor. He has received the grace of God and was seen as righteous by God. And God rescued him from Sodom and Gomorrah. And actually the description of Lot there, um, I think probably fits a lot of us as we look at the world around us today. Why, what does it say? For by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Ugh. I don't want to hear anything else about it, right? It just sickens me. And it sickened Lot, and God saved him from that fire. Genesis 
chapter 19, we see Lot pleading with the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. What would they say about Lot? They said, uh, furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien and already he's acting as a judge. Thought it very interesting. Isn't that the favorite scripture of today? Judge not, lest ye be judged. That's now the favorite. That's what the men of Sodom and Gomorrah was saying too. Who are you to judge? Lot? No, we need to start with judgment because that's where we begin. We are lost and deserving of judgment apart from Christ. Lastly, we come back to the point, verse 9. And what good news it is, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. And he knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Romans chapter 12, and I'll close. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And here it is. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Don't take things that aren't yours. And God says, look, vengeance and wrath is not yours. That's mine. But what does Peter say? That's good. He knows how to do it. I don't. Right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. How, how, um, how important it is today that we hear these words, Father. We too look around at the world around us and, and Lord, it's just so wicked. And it seems to be getting worse and worse and it is. And Lord, we could be tempted to fret, to worry. We could be fr- tempted to take matters into our own hands. But help us to hear this word today that you have it. You know how to rescue the godly and you know how to punish the wicked. You know what you're doing and we can trust you with it. Lord, help us to do that today. And just as Noah did, Lord, help us to find favor in your eyes. Lord, give us your grace today. Help us to preach your righteousness, your word. Lord, help us to walk with you. And we ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen.